Netflix, I got a pitch for you. This is Fritz Duquesne. Think James Bond meets Indiana Jones, but better in every way. We got double agents, we got murder on the high seas, we got prison escapes, we got triple agents, fraud, seduction, kidnapping, revenge, and you want to know the best part? It's like 85% real. At least. This episode is sponsored by Call of War, the World War II strategy game played against real players in real time. I know, the mobile games with silly names, they finally got me. But I'll have you know, this is actually a cross-platform game with a silly name. I've gotten a lot of offers from different apps, and so far I've turned them all down. But I went with this one, because back in the day, this same company had a World War I game, and let me tell you, I played a lot of that game. Just because the scope of it is insane. You join the war as a country of your choice, there's up to 100 players on on one map for you to ally with and stab in the back at your own discretion, and everything plays out in real time, so you end up with these epic knockdown drag out battles spanning over weeks. And it looks like they've really upped the tech tree with this game as well. I'm excited to get into it. I'm gonna be playing a game with anyone who wants to join me. Just search for Jack Rackham and use the password Duquesne. The game's already free, but if you use the link in the description, you'll get 13,000 gold and a month of high command as a bonus. As a wise man once said, I look forward to killing you soon. Now, despite overflowing with Aussie energy, I mean, look at him, the man was actually a South African boar, coming from a family of farmers and hunters, including his father Abraham, his mother Minna, and his brother Pedro. They also ran a small shop where they'd sell some of their goods throughout the year, and tragedy struck when Fritz was 12 years old, as his mother was attacked by an unhappy customer. Fritz watched as the scene unfolded, and then wrestled control of the man's spear and ran it through his stomach. This kid's metal as hell. His parents eventually decide that the frontier may not be the best environment for him to grow up in, so they send him to school in England. After that, he allegedly went to Oxford University and the Royal Military Academy in Brussels, but no one's found any records of his enrollment, and according to Duquesne himself, he was on his way to Europe to study engineering when he decided to go on a world tour with a random embezzler he met on the boat ride over. But then the Boers find diamonds, and the British want those diamonds, so they declare war, so Fritz comes back home and enlists in the army, now speaking with a posh British accent which I'm sure was very well received by his peers. And he does some soldier stuff, fights bravely for his homeland, gets wounded, but it's also at this point that he adopts a moniker, and no joke, he becomes known as the Black Panther. He ends up being put in charge of a mission to get all the gold in the central bank out of the country before the British can steal it, but people start thinking maybe they could take a little cut, and a fight breaks out and Duquesne finds himself one of a handful of survivors. Clearly, he can't continue transporting all of it alone, so he orders the remaining men to hide it away. Add buried treasure to the list of cool things surrounding this dude because people are still looking for it to this day. He ends up getting captured and sent to a detention camp in Lisbon, and this is where the real fun begins. It begins with the perfect crime. He's plotting his escape at midnight. Does he go for the cell bars? No. He goes for the tunnel. It's a classic. As he's scheming, a woman catches him. She tells him to stop. It's her father's jail. She's Donna Juana. He says no. They make love all night. In the morning, she unlocks his cell and he escapes in borrowed clothing. The ship's bound for Paris, but he continues to England. Doesn't trust her. Besides, he likes the overcast. At this point, he signs up for the British Army. Due to his skills in Afrikaans, he's promoted to an officer. But he's a double agent, and he's just got his ticket back to South Africa. Unfortunately, his route takes him right through his childhood moisture farm, and he finds it desecrated. What's more, his sister's been killed and his mother is dying in a British concentration camp. The man responsible was Lord Kitchener, who'd been implementing a scorched earth strategy and rounding up the civilians into concentration camps under the watch of the British so they couldn't aid the guerrilla forces. And Fritz swears revenge. He organizes a group of 20 men. Their plan is to target the munition dumps, blow up the rail yards, cause as much chaos as possible, and when the time is right, to approach Kitchener as one of his loyal officers and end his life. But one of the guy's wives found out and everyone was sentenced to death. 
Fritz, thinking fast, got his sentence commuted to life in prison in exchange for delivering secret codes to the British, which he claims were all made up, but who knows, I mean, he's kind of the definition of an unreliable narrator. So he's stuck in the Castle of Good Hope, but inspired by its chipper name, he works for months to chip away at the walls and construct a tunnel leading out of the prison. Except when it finally comes time to bid farewell, the stone blocks in the wall collapse on him and trap him there overnight until the guards find him halfway out of his cell the next morning. Now he's shipped off to Bermuda, described as a, quote, impossible, hopeless, and impregnable prison of pink sand beaches and sunlit waters from which no prisoner could escape. But seriously, it was half a world away, and oh yeah, an island. So he just climbed over the barbed wire fence, swam cut and bloodied 1.5 miles through shark-infested waters to the main island, found refuge with some Quaker sympathizers, teamed up with a prostitute, knocked out and impersonated one of her clients, and sailed all the way to Baltimore. And then the war ended, and the British wanted him dead, so he figured he'd chill in America for a while. And oh, if you thought he'd just settle down and take up a career as an adventure novelist, well he did do that, but also he got brought in as an expert to advance a proposal to bring in $250,000 of hippos into Louisiana. That way they could be turned into lake cow bacon. Which probably would have been an environmental disaster, but it would have been amazing. But never mind that, he comes out the other side of it as Teddy Roosevelt's personal shooting instructor. A known spy just broke out of prison and charmed his way into the White House. Then, guess what, it's World War I, and spotting another opportunity to stick it to the British for what they did in South Africa, he abandons his old life and volunteers as a German spy. The Germans send him to Brazil, where he introduces himself to Brazilian officials as Hello, yes, I am scientist, me amo Frederick. Frederick who? Uh, Frederick... Fredericks. And they believe him! And he sinks 22 merchant ships by sticking time bombs on them disguised as mineral samples, but that's not all. He takes out American insurance on all of them, so now he's cashing out on the equivalent of over $2 million. One of his accomplices got caught and ended up exposing Frederick Fredericks, but it turns out to be a blessing in disguise. You see, first, Fritz did what any German operative would do and faked his own death after taking up residence in Buenos Aires. But after that, German intelligence assigns him his dream job. It's finally time to kill Kitchener. Eh, uh, maybe. Officially what happened was that Kitchener's ship diverted off course to avoid bad weather, ran into a mine, and sank. Fritz's whole career revolved around telling tall tales to make himself more popular. It's technically possible things went the way he said they did, but the evidence is conveniently missing. So for now, this is more of an amusing hypothetical than legitimate history. But with that out of the way, allow me to weave you a tale of the man who took down Kitchener. Kitchener was the face of the war in Britain. Like, literally, that famous poster, that's Kitchener. But by 1916, he lost favor with the top brass and had gotten sidelined. Now he's got an important mission to Arkhangelsk to negotiate with the Russians and keep them in the war. One big chance to prove himself. Accompanying Kitchener on this trip was a Russian nobleman, Count Boris Zakrevsky, or so he thought. According to Duquesne, the real Zakrevsky had been kidnapped and replaced with none other than the Black Panther himself. The ship diverts its path to avoid bad weather, Fritz excuses himself from entertaining the crew with his thick Russian accent and scurries back to his room, lighting a signal out the window for the German U-boats to attack. But the Germans strike too soon, Fritz is still aboard! He tumbles across the deck, watching Kitchener run uselessly toward the bow as it tipped up to the sky. He leaves the man to his watery grave as he grabs a raft and rushes into a daring leap over the side. For 15 minutes, he hears the wails of British sailors, and then all is quiet. He drifts alone, wondering if he's only delaying the inevitable, until the U-boat rises up underneath him. The day is saved, he returns to Germany, and is presented with an iron cross, and everybody clapped. But you know, probably it was a mine. After that, he went to Washington, D.C. to try and take advantage of his connection with the Louisiana Hippo Senator, but nothing really came of it before the war ended. But apparently, even though he'd gotten into it for revenge, it seems like Fritz just really enjoyed being the center of attention and the satisfaction of duping people, because he made the very unusual choice of transforming himself into a public figure. 
but Tales of African Safaris were so five years ago, so he just invented some new stories. And so he becomes Aussie war hero Claude Stoughton. How you going? Been bayoneted three times, gassed four times, stuck once with a hook. Nasty bugger that one. Probably seen more war than any man at present. Mind you, the war was over and the Americans had no problem with him. This disguise was not a necessity. But then suddenly, the feds raid his New York City apartment and find, among other things, a suspicious amount of information on ship bombings and a letter from the German government saying, Oh, congratulations, you've made such a great contribution to the German war effort. And what tipped them off? Insurance fraud, baby. So at this point, the details get a little foggy because he got arrested twice, and one of the books I've been referencing kind of muddles the two arrests together, but he ends up faking paralysis. Probably because he got beat up at some point, but I like to imagine the cops walk in on him in his apartment and he suddenly cries, Oh no, my legs! So the US is going to give him to the UK to serve his sentence there for murder on the high seas before he gets shipped back to the US to serve his sentence for fraud. But he ends up spending two years in a New York prison hospital on account of his phony paralysis. And mere days before he finally gets sent across the pond, he cuts the bars to his cell, disguises himself as a woman, climbs over the wall, and runs off into the night. Now, considering his track record with the Germans, you'd think he'd be able to settle down there without any problems, but no, he spends five years in Mexico, and then comes back to the US, back to New York City, where he invents a new identity and starts working in the movie industry while simultaneously working with a biographer to publish a book about himself. Well, six years later, the cops arrest him, and his biographer tries to defend him by saying, No, that's not Fritz Duquesne, that's my good friend Major Craven. They don't buy it, and they end up getting the guy who arrested him last time to ID him, but when he goes to trial, the British say, Ah, oh, him? Nah, don't worry about it. Statue of limitations are expired. Besides, that was the war to end all wars. We won't have to worry about him spying on us on behalf of the Germans ever again. Alright, so after getting let off the hook, Fritz figures it's okay to start talking to his friends for hours on end about how he used to blow up merchant ships for the Germans. Plus, not sure if you remember, he published a book about it! All this meant that when he decided to become a Nazi and start spying on the US all the way back in 1937, he was one of the most famous spies in the world, which for spies is the opposite of an accolade. The FBI director spoke directly with the president about him, and now the US has a double agent working to take him down. And I'd love to go on about what an epic battle of the minds it was, but most of the time it was just FBI agents doing a Scooby-Doo chase in slow motion. Like, Fritz would take an elevator one floor up and then take the stairs back down and then spin around in a revolving door without going anywhere. At one point he just stopped and asked the guy to leave him alone. But when he finally thinks he's alone, he reveals a bunch of US technology he's stolen and... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Still, he had 33 guys working under him, so his trial turned out to be the largest espionage case in US history. He got hit with 18 years in prison and a $2,000 fine, and at age 64, he wasn't pulling any more great escapes. But he got released after only 14 years on account of his health, at which point he managed to sneak in just one last public lecture about how cool he was before he died. <laughs> 